Good morning. You're watching Aim on Air, where specialising in connecting companies with its shareholders is what we do best. Hello and welcome to Aim on Air. My name is Liam and today I'm pleased to be presenting a new company to you. Cobra Resources is an advanced exploration and resource development company unlocking value through growing its gold resources, accelerating rare earth discovery and advancing iron oxide copper gold exploration in South Australia's world-class mineral jurisdiction, the Gawler Creighton. Today's guest is none other than Rupert Verko, CEO. Welcome to the show, Rupert. Hi, Liam. Thank you very much for having me and giving me this opportunity. Not a problem. Uh, as always, I like to lead with an icebreaker, and I thought as this is uh, make it a nice, easy one for you as this is our first interview together. Um, so you've been put in charge of the food at the company barbecue. Uh, what's your signature dish going to be? Oh, look, Liam, uh, us Australians love our barbecues, and uh, I'm a farmer by heart. Uh, grew up on a farm, so... Uh, sheep and cattle production are very close to me. So uh, lamb chops are certainly up there, uh, followed by a bit of wild duck maybe, maybe some wild duck sausages, and um, we'll have to back it up with, uh, with a very nice scotch fillet as well, I'd say, mate. Look, I, I, I love my cooking and I love my food, so I could talk about it all day, but <laughs> if it's a barbie, we'll just sit, we'll s stick with the staples. How about that? <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, as as, uh, as I've just alluded, this is our first time talking, uh, and I'd like to find out a little bit more about you if I can. Could you tell me about, um, say, 11-year-old Rupert, um, where he grew up and what sort of things he was into? Yeah, sure. So uh, I grew up on a on a, a grazing farm on the lower lakes uh, that's a couple of hours uh, south of Adelaide, uh, where the Murray River comes out into some lakes before it goes into the ocean. So I was really fortunate outside uh, most of my childhood. Uh, loved working with animals, uh, loved my sport, loved my cricket and my Aussie rules. Uh, spent a lot of time playing that. Um, unfortunately, Kate has carried on older in life. And at the moment, I am uh, with with shock and horror watching the Aussies capitulate over in India and uh, getting very nervous about going over to the UK to f uh, see them um, compete against the baseball. Uh, hopefully we can improve our performances over there to make it a competitive and exciting Ashes series. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, thank you. You started to study geology in 2004 at the Adelaide University. What was it that attracted you to it? Uh, Lamb, I actually started studying aquaculture and uh, made the change because, uh, as one of the one of the initial entry subjects, geology was one that I took and I really enjoyed it. It complemented my chemistry skill set really well, and I think from that um, from that upbringing of always being outside, geology certainly offered a an opportunity to pursue a career where uh, you get to travel and. And, and work in, um, not always in an office, and uh, something about that really resonated with me, and that sort of uh, was the foundations for my mining career, and that led into mining engineering and, and mining operations. So, um, yeah, it was a, it was a, uh, I came across it by accident. I uh, didn't go into it passionately, but I've certainly, uh, uh, certainly loved the journey and, and, and loved the profession. Uh, that's perfect, which leads me nicely into after four years of study, you graduated with first class honours. Um, you've worked for multiple companies that have uh, given you experience that you have today. Are there any highlights you'd like to share with us from that, that time prior to where you are now? Uh, Liam, I've, I've always enjoyed working on the smaller projects, to tell you the truth, where you get an opportunity to um, cross the boundaries on on your roles and responsibilities so obviously i started out as a geologist and enjoyed working as a mine surveyor and a mining engineer and i think my practical applications as a farmer in my upbringing helped me be able to develop uh executable and robust mine plans and i've, I've worked into that and into mine management um, i spent a lot of time um, or on and off through my career around the Gawler Creighton at mines like the Challenger Gold Mine, 
um, peculiar knob iron ore mine, uh, which is a, a very interesting metamorphic deposit where I held both technical and, and management roles and um, and also the Tarkula gold mine where I was the mine manager. So I have fam a familiarity with, with gold mineralization within the Gawler Creighton and um, and uh, after that work, I, I went and uh, did some um, more global consulting work, uh, both in, in mine management and mine optimization work, and um, ended up with Cobra, where um, I'm still learning new skills and and uh, being exposed to different aspects of the of of the mining cycle as it be, and uh, really enjoying it. Which is uh, which does lead us beautifully in into today uh, with with Cobra Resources and it's exciting within your project. Can you tell me about a bit more about the history of, of of that tenement, please? Sure. So the the project is comprised of five tenements. Uh, initially, the ground was first really worked by Newmont in the late nineties, and it was picked up by them on the back of um the challenger gold discovery that was identified through cow creek sampling up in the northern gall of creighton and uh, I, I think um when you have big companies like newmont um staking large amounts of ground in in new new jurisdictions it's generally a good endorsement for the prospective geology of the area um they discovered a little deposit in New South Wales called Cadia at the time. So their focus shifted and um, they farmed uh, the project out. They retained a royalty on it uh, to a company called Adelaide Resources, who have now grown into Andromeda Metals. And they did some amazing cowcrete work over a very broad area. And we're talking um, two, over 2,000 square kilometres where they identified a number of uh, gold anomalies on the back of, of some really good geophysics work that, that Newmont had done. And some of their first holes that they drilled, uh, they identified gold mineralization at, at prospects uh, that we now called, called barns and white tank, and, and subsequently have defined, uh, they define a component of our now gold resources. So, um, there was really good foundations built in terms of the work that had been done before Wooden, uh, Cobra was involved. Um, as Andromeda started to focus on their, their clay and uh, um, projects over on the Western Air Peninsula, which isn't far from our assets, uh, they were looking for to do something with the Woodner project. And that's where Cobra identified the opportunity and um, and picked up the earning on it. So we're now very close to our 75% earning milestone and our strategy with it has been a threefold approach. We recognize the value in obviously the gold. Um, however, there is significant potential for uh, the Javier on or, or also the Olympic Dam style um, IOCG um, style of mineralization, we're really surrounded by a number of very unique and, and high value um, prospective resources. Just to the north, we've got Investigator with a multi million ounce silver deposit, uh, Manini Dam, which is lead, zinc, and silver. Uh, we have a really diverse mis mineralizing system and we've got a significant holding on it. So we're taking a, uh, an approach where we, we're trying to provide investors that exposure to a, a very systematic um, growth strategy where we're advancing our gold resources. And through that exploration work that we were doing for IOCGs, one of the pathfinder indicators for IOCGs is rare earths. And uh, we started to see anomalism uh, in rare earths and, and, and then subsequently significant intersections of rare earths within the, the saprolite or the clay zone of um, of the geology, and that actually overlies a lot of our gold mineralization. And um, that's really um, developed an approach that we're taking where we're trying to 
strategically now grow uh, dual commodities of rare earths and gold. Um, so that that's that's really come about in the last two years, and we've been able to move very quickly and and establish a, a rare earth resource that's now complementing our gold resources. Wow, that's amazing! Uh, just a couple of questions off that actually. What uh, what's the geology make up like there? Like sort of what sort of rocks base rocks is it? And and so yeah, what sort of base so rocks the, you got down there? So the rocks are, are, are generally where we're focused with our current exploration is is granites. So we have granite intrusives with what is also known as the Hildebersweet intrusives. So these are volcanic mafix that are intruding into um, into these in place granites. Uh, yeah. We have Hutchinson Group meta sediments that are important for our ISCG story. Um, however, the 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 granite and the Hildebus Sweet intrusives are the important components of the geology for both the gold and the rare earth stories. That's fantastic. Did you, uh, you alluded um, just a moment ago that um, a pathfinder element to, to finding gold is the rare earths. Was, was there a sort of a bit of a shock to, to the office or the geology team when, when you actually realised you had a lot more going on than, than maybe first thought? Look, I, I think uh, initially with with when we took a very cautious approach with the rare earths, um, rare earths are a very challenging commodity and the complexity of the mineralisation is something that is very important uh, and, and effectively underlies the economic potential of a rare earth occurrence. So we took an approach that we wanted to validate the potential of of a style of mineralization called clay absorption, um, which is or, or ionic absorption, which is amenable to more cost efficient methods of extraction uh, than what the hard rock phases of rare earths are. Um, but uh, I, I suppose the the challenge with with the rare earths that that has taken has meant we've taken that cautious approach is that. Uh, there is a lot of complexities around the mineralogy and that leads into complex metallurgy. And we've, in Australia, um, are fairly new to the rare earths. It's been controlled by the Chinese in terms of mining and production for a very long time. And, and we're working hard with um, uh, engaging partners like the University of Adelaide and University of South Australia to identify the mineralogy and what enablers we have for metallurgy on that story. So now we're starting to get some confidence in the in the style of mineralization we have, and and that's owing to um, progressing our story. It's it's almost like you've you've read my script here. Uh, uh, Baggy Green, um, you've a clay hosted total rare earth oxides uh, with a York resource estimate of twenty point nine metric tons at five hundred sixty eight parts per million above and proximal to your 94,000 ounce gold resource. Is it possible, and I might be getting a bit ahead of myself here, so please do stop me. Is, is it possible to leverage the rare earth oxides to pay for the capex of getting to your gold? Um, well, if, and, if, yeah, no, it is a very interesting story. And I think that's where we see opportunity with the rare earths. Um, there are a lot of companies focusing on clay hosted rare earths in Australia at present. We see we have a standout opportunity with the style of our mineralization in that it's, it's beneficial because if we were to go and open cut mine our gold resources, we would be capitalizing that waste that sits above it. And those rare earths occur within that waste. So we can see a value add opportunity uh, and, um, in regards to the rare earths. And that we see has a potential potential advantage for us to be able to uh, spend more focus on the metallurgical challenges uh, as as we can potentially sustain a a opex criteria um, that that not other not a lot of other players have and um, the, the benefit with that uh, goes into the environmental component so 
per per metal component produced out of the mine means you have a lower carbon footprint, a lower disturbance footprint. So we we see it as being a very unique occurrence, and we really want to capitalise on that opportunity. That must um, it almost must like most most miners would would have to think about their their waste rock landform and and how they're going to build this huge uh mountain or hill of, of of earth as they extract it that they don't need um but but you you must d- does that give you the economic edge being able to actually charge for it make money off of it is probably the better phrase uh, rather than just building this massive hill and it sits there until you're ready to put it back look uh if if we get the metallurgy right uh it will give plenty of opportunities around leaching, heat leaching uh, of the rare earth before we potentially process the gold um, and, and, and backfilling components where it will cover the cost of, of, of returning that to the to, to pits. So we see that there's a lot of follow-on benefits of being able to define value out of that, that overburden. And um, we see that now... Uh, with with our story, that if we can address those challenges very early on, and then come up with uh, a financial or a strategic pathway to be able to produce rare earths from a from a gold producing operation, it really gives you leverage on on commodity markets, um, some some security on that. And and certainly flexibility in your mine plan to be able to um, change to variable conditions of of both market and and mining risks. So uh, there's a lot of benefits, and that's why um, dual commodity mines are such a are such a great asset uh, for a lot of the the leading tier one miners of the world. Speaking of which. What analogies to the Greatland Gold um, and its its dual commodity Javier on discovery might there be? Oh God! Well, uh, we're talking about one of the the great discoveries of the last ten years uh, in Australia with Javier on. Um, I, I suppose that dual commodity output is certainly one of the components. Um, Javier on is is blessed that it has. You, generally, you need two components to really make a successful mine. You either need to have grade or you need to have quantity. And starting to look like Javier on really has both of them. Um, we we see with gold now, we we now have a combined resource of it's still at 211,000 ounces, but we're defining significant zones outside of that resource, uh, particularly at the Clark Prospect, where... Uh, we see we're going to grow it and grow it significantly. And if we believe uh, with some of the work that we're doing at present that we're going to be able to expand that. And we're already defining the scalability of the rare earths and the potential for that clay absorption over significant areas. Uh, we announced with our rare earth resource a exploration target at the Thompson Prospect that's that's certainly significant. So we feel like we can tick those boxes on both commodities of of demonstrating that scale to ensure that you get stable long-term supply, which is certainly an important component for the rare earths. And let's just talk about those um, just for a moment there. What what markets are there for rare earths and, and, and what makes them so critical at the moment? Well, rare earths aren't traded on a metals exchange at present. Um, they, when you talk generally about rare earths, we're talking about fifteen lanthanides, uh, uh, yttrium included, and they have a d- very diverse uh, range of of applications, particularly focused around electrification and electrification technologies. Um, so. The interesting component about rare earths and why they're critical is there's a number of components that are are driving the demand and the sovereign security requirements for uh, rare earth earth production. Um, If you you look at their application, rare earths, particularly the magnet rare earths, when we talk about magnet rare earths, we're referring to 
uh, two lights being neod neodymium and praseodymium, and then two heavy rare earths in terbium and diprosium. And they're utilised in electric motors uh, that makes them efficient, uh, and, and reduce the energy consumption. So they're critical to global um, decarbonisation targets uh, in, in outputting this. They're, they're often referred to as both the enabler for the technology and the potential bottleneck in terms of being able to secure um, supply. But what, what is, is, is very interesting in the rare earth market is they're being applied to your Milwaukee drill that you might have at home, your battery drill. Um, and then, and, and there's a couple hundred grams may go into that electric motor. And then on the other scale, the defense um, applications for rare earths is significant. So a v Virginia class submarine, for example, has over four tons of, of those four rare earths um, within wow. within one um, one of those subs. So uh, for for developed nations such as or countries such as the US, uh, securing supply of these rare earths is very important for their sovereignty and and reducing or mitigating geopolitical risk. And at present, China has really owned uh, not only the mine supply, where they produce over sixty percent of the mined rare earths, but they also control the downstream processing of rare earths where they process over 90% of, um, of rare earths into end user applications. So uh, the rest of uh, the Western world has started to catch up and, and identify this as a potential risk in us trying to pursue our um, uh, decarbonisation strategies to reduce um, or, or to electrify uh, our lives and and rare earths are really important to this and it's driving the demand and the current interest um, to be able to do this. But the other component is, is the complexity of the mineralogy. So uh, not all rare earths are created equal and every style of mineralogy has its as challenges and opportunities. So um, that's that's the the complex nature of the rare earth market. Um, and it's something very difficult that um, is, is a difficult uh, challenge for investors to be able to understand and to be able to um, identify where value is in both discoveries and and rare earth projects. So um, yeah, it's it's certainly an exciting market, um, but has a lot of moving parts and a lot of complexities that um, a casual observer needs to overcome. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, it, the the twenty twenty three exploration program, um, I believe, gets underway hopefully soon. Uh, just a couple of quick fire questions for you. Um, which of your projects do you favour for drilling this year? So. Uh, we on Tuesday we just announced Liam um, the geophysical results of a co-funded uh, CSAMT uh, magnetotelluric survey at the Clark Prospect. So at Clark we've defined over six hundred meters of um, strike of gold mineralization, and this has some of the highest grade rare earth mineralization overlaying it. Um, so. We're going to do some closeout work to be able to incorporate that gold mineralization into the resource. Um, we're going to try and expand on um, some of our gold resources at Barnes and White Tank. And additionally, we're going to grow our, um, our rare earth footprint. But th what this geophysical survey has told us is it's enabled us to really look at the structural controls that we see at Clark and evaluate them against um, the un, unmineralized structures. And we've been able to apply this to our database of, of geophysics and identify a number. I think um, we have about seven. We've got seven additional targets that are peripheral to Clark and Baggy Green uh, that have these geophysical signatures that um, 
really reflect what we're seeing at Clark. So we're going to uh, go and test them with air core drilling, and this will this will be a twofold approach. So we'll test the the basement potential for gold, but it'll also expand on that rare earth mineralization footprint. So uh, we'll be chasing these deep channels, mineralized potentially mineralized structures for both golds. And that, that gold mineralization is the catalyst and the enrichment component for the clay hosted rare earths. It, it sounds like a win win. Um, have you set a date yet for your exploration program to start? Drilling uh, is scheduled to commence mid March. Uh, we will have two rigs on site um, uh, from, from late March, and uh, drilling will probably go for. Uh, a couple of months. So uh, we'll have RC and air core drilling happening in unison. So uh, plenty of news flow and plenty of results uh, in the first half of this year. Fantastic. And please feel free to elaborate a little bit more on this one. What are your objectives that you have set for the 2023 program? Well, look, the, the first component is to really um, grow our resources. So we've we haven't updated our gold mineral resource estimate uh, since 2019. So we have a, a significant amount of drilling, almost 10,000 metres worth of RC drilling that will constitute a resource update. Um, and then look, we've defined a rare earth resource basically off the back of reanalysis of historic drilling. We haven't gone and done extensive uh, expansion drilling and this drilling is really aimed at, at growing that resource and being able to identify um, uh, gold mineralization potential further abreast of, of where our current resources lie. That's great thank you uh, for the first time Cobra has spoken openly about commencing strategic discussions aimed at project advancement could, could you tell me about that please and, and what does that mean? Look, uh, particularly with the rare earths, uh, we see we have an opportunity to be able to potentially develop something fairly unique. So um, as I mentioned earlier, rare earths aren't traded. Rare earths are, um, generally require an offtake agreement. So we're currently going through the metallurgical processes to be able to understand what uh, potential metallurgical flow sheet may be. Um, and on the back of that, we would look then at what the feasibility economics are for extraction, and that would feed into what we would call a scoping study. And that's the foundation to define pro potential project economics um, and, and to be able to then advance into mining lease application and, and to go from being an explorer to a near-term producer. So uh, we really see that um, now having those dual resources refined, it, it gives us that leverage to be able to um, commence that journey. Uh, for my final question um, to you, I, I wanted to look actually into, into your future. In, in broad terms, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> what does the journey look like uh, to transition from a resource definition uh, to resource development, uh, that's like you moving from explorer to a miner. What what are the big milestones to get through in order to develop a project such as such as one that's as awesome as yours? Look, I, th I think first for us, uh, we want to be able to define a significant resource before we get to that point. So this drilling is very important to be able to expand on what we currently have. Um, after that point, it will be to to do some infill drilling. Uh, that will one, um, provide certainty around our estimations and confidence. Um, and, and then it will be to provide the right samples for metallurgy. So to develop a, an efficiency of extraction, we already have great uh, metallurgy results around our gold. Uh, so we need to then focus on our rare earths. And, and then we start looking at what the scoping requirements are for capital requirements. Um, and, and then we start to, from that point, that is a significant point. Um, if we were to announce the scoping study and then work into pre-feasibility followed by feasibility. 
and that would feed into uh, a mining application. So there, that's the progress forward uh, that we need to start working to, and and that's what the market should be looking for. That's really, really exciting. Um, well, sadly, that brings me to the end of my questions, Rupert. Thank you so much for joining me um, on this interview today. Do you have anything else you'd like to say to our audience or, or more importantly, your shareholders? Oh, look, uh, other than the, hopefully uh, the Australians can, can get their act together before they hit the UK soil and, um, <laughs> and, and they don't try and address the baseball issue with uh, <laughs> reverse sweeps on an on a over-by-over basis. But, um, <laughs> no, look, I, I think, <laughs> I think uh, Liam, uh, what we're, we're very focused on is is trying to develop a very unique story and provide shareholders with exposure to um, to a very strategic uh, resource base being gold and rare earths and then as we grow and develop uh, provide them that blue sky opportunity uh, to be able to provide uh, to make one of those heavy on style discoveries with with some really great um, IOCG targets within within the Gawler crate, and I think that's that's uh, the short term component. But uh, look, we we have a team that has great mining experience and great project experience, and we're very focused on being able to maximise that return for shareholders uh, through advancing this project. So uh, if anyone's interested, please uh, uh, check us out on socials or, or look at our website, www.cobraplc.com. Thank you, Rupert, and, and thank you for being a guest on our show. Thank you, Liam. Thanks for your time. No problem. Sadly, that is the end of the webcast, ladies and gents. If you want to reach out to us, you can contact us on Twitter with the address on the screen. Uh, you should also really subscribe to this channel so that you do not miss any more of our conversations. Until next time, my name's Liam and you've been watching an Aim on Air where specialising in connecting companies with shareholders is what we do best. Thank you. <laughs>